Thank you, Thank you very much, Roger. It's great to see so many of you here today. Welcome. This works far, far better as conversation rather than presentation, so please just interrupt, heckle, whatever. Um, I should have, though more observant than you would have spotted, but I've got a screen recorder running, so I'd like to share this more publicly afterwards. So if you don't want to be recorded on the recording, speak very quietly when you ask your question. It shouldn't pick it up. Um, I am working at University of Roehampton now. Oh, what we're going to do this afternoon, you can't quite see all of the detail there. I want to start by telling you a little about what I'm doing at Roehampton University. Deal with the P word, start talking about pedagogy. I'm also going to have a line about pedagogy as the new curriculum. But actually, the new curriculum is going to be a really exciting thing. And we might want to chat a bit more about that. Talk about some older pedagogies, set this in the context of what's happened in the past, talk about theories of learning that are really quite well established, share with you some of our students' experience of their experience of learning ICT when they were at school and the skills which they're coming up with and the way they go about learning about computers, learning about technology, and then look at some more modern pedagogies, starting with Papert and thinking about constructionism and building things, but also talking about partnering strategies, uh, talking about game-based learning and gamification, talking about connectivism, and talking about workplace-based learning, which I think is still of relevance to the school sector. And then there are, what is that, about seven bullet points to put up on the screen if we actually manage to get that far before time is up. Um, so here we go. This is where I work. This is Roehampton University. This is Froebel College. That isn't actually my office there. That's where the Vice-Chancellor's office is. That's, no, 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 that's not going to take that ambitions in that direction. Anybody here who trained at Roehampton themselves? I see that I've got at least two people in the audience who are training at Roehampton. It's very, very good to see you both. Anybody else? Any of my other present students who are correcting? Okay, we we are a university. A lot of our students are doing teacher training courses. My work is on the primary teacher training programs. We have about, oh, must be about 800 undergraduate students and another 300 or so postgraduate students. And I agree with Gove on this point and possibly now one or two others that the next generation of teachers, the present generation of teachers entering the profession now, is the best ever. The enthusiasm which my students bring to their studies, the enthusiasm which they put into their placement is just so lovely to see. And I'm not saying that just because I've got those two in the room here. It really is. So those of you who are working in schools, be excited about the generation of teachers that are going to be joining you very, very soon. Well, Hampton has a long history. And one it's, it's made up of four colleges, like Oxford, like Cambridge. We're a collegiate university. I'm based at... Froebel College, which named after Friedrich Froebel, who was the German educationist who invented the kindergarten movement. And here we have a German painting of a kindergarten in process. Um, anybody want to do an in the picture that they can see? What, what, what sort of thing is happening in this particular learning environment? Experiential Absolutely. There are children who are exploring, who are experiencing, who are, there's, there's all of this rich environment of resources. Any other comments on the picture? They are outdoors. And look, they're doing things for themselves. Is there teaching going on here? There's plenty of learning happening, isn't there? And of course there are adults there, and a lot of what would happen in the kindergarten is about putting play, putting experiences in the way of children, and that being the place where learning happens. And I think, I think I'm right in saying that with ICT education, we get to carry on playing way, way after kindergarten stage. And that's one of the things which I want to return to later. Another of Froebel's ideas was the notion of the Froebel gifts. And we have this sequence of 10 gifts, 10 presents in a row, which you give to the child as they reach, as they grow up. And one of those is the building blocks there. So Froebel had this idea way, way before the Lego folk had of putting things together, of children building things for themselves and learning about the world through putting these blocks together, through building things. And I think perhaps as we start thinking about ICT curriculum as well as ICT pedagogy, we think about the building blocks that we're going to be fitting together when we come to designing our own curriculum. Now, one of, one of the, the students in America who went to a Froebel-style kindergarten was Frank Lloyd Wright. And you know, that he'd, at an early age, he was playing with blocks like this, I think had some influence on the work which he did as an architect later in life. There's more than a passing resemblance, don't you think? Yeah. 
that perhaps the experiences that we put in the way of our children, the toys that we let them play with, the opportunities which we provide for them, are going to be some of the things which make a real difference in their later life. The children who are playing with scratch blocks now in primary school may well become the coders of the future, as the Secretary of State was talking about this morning. Um, so who here is an actual classroom, school-based, bona fide ICT teacher? That's not quite the majority, but it's good to have you here, folks, it really is. Tell me a little about how you go about teaching ICT. Does anybody want to volunteer? Tell me about a typical lesson. Okay. Usually based on learning some software. Learning some software. How do, you, how, how do they go about learning software in your lessons? Or learning to use software in your So the creativity, the opportunity, oh, yeah. providing foundation skills, and then opportunity for them to create things themselves. Anybody else want to tell us about their typical ICT lesson? Yeah. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Oh, isn't that lovely? This, you know, again, coming back to that sort of frozen kindergarten play base. Do you, do you, do you use the word play with your pupils? Yeah. I like that very, very much. <laughs> that's brilliant. And, you know, we, we talk a lot about play based learning, and I think that's great. And I, I mean, one of the things that struck me this morning in the, the Go speech was, was this notion of play based teaching now, that we have the freedom now to start tinkering with curriculum and what we teach as well as providing opportunities for children to tinker as they learn. The, the word pedagogue is one which comes loaded with assumptions, but those assumptions aren't necessarily accurate. If you look back to the etymology of the word, the pedagogue wasn't the teacher in ancient Greece. The pedagogue was the household slave who accompanied the child to the place where the learning took place. I think there's an important message there for us. It is about providing the opportunity for learning, I would say. Okay? Ofsted's report, were not, they were quite critical of what was happening in ICT lessons. There's an interesting quote there when they came to compare the ICT happening in ICT timetable lessons with what they saw happening elsewhere. Greater pedagogical skills and understanding of many teachers of other subjects observed in the survey. Excessive focus in Q-Stage 4 on the particular requirements of exam accreditation. So there is this feeling there that the pedagogy in ICT isn't perhaps as advanced as it is in other areas. I think that's probably unfair, but if it is accurate, then that's surely something which we ought to do, with, do something about. Anybody recognize the quote on the screen there? Thank you, Raphael. This morning, this is what the Secretary of State had to say, that the way we teach, he sees, is something which hasn't changed significantly since the days of Plato's Academy, that a Victorian, this is something Papert writes about, a Victorian coming into a modern schoolroom could still pretty much do the job. And Go, bless him, says this is going to change, and then this, this model will change dramatically in the next 10 or even 20 years from now. Well, we'll see. Um, it hasn't yet. Okay. Who can recognize all three people on the screen? Okay, I'm getting B.F. Skinner, the gentleman on the left. Piaget in the middle, and... Bigotsky, thank you very much, on the right. So we have here three approaches to thinking about pedagogy. And this applies way, way beyond just ICT. So we have with Skinner the notion of behaviorism. I characterize it as, I'm gonna ask you some questions. If you get the answer right, I will give you a biscuit. Um, you get this a lot, I'm not actually going to give biscuits, okay. <laughs> there are no biscuits. Um, but, but we see this a lot in computer-based learning, I think. With Piaget, we think in terms of the lone scientist, of the child discovering about the world around them. And we see that, I think, so much in our own learning about ICT, in our own learning to use computers. We will sit down with the machine, with the software, have a go, much in the way that the lady at the back there described her 16-plus ICT lessons. 
you know, have a go, play, discover, experiment. I see this with my one-year-old daughter. She's not being taught things, but she is learning so, so much through this discovery, through this experiment. I think for many of us, this is how we go about learning ICT. But the Vygotsky idea of social constructivism that we learn best through talking to other people, through listening to other people, through seeing what other people have done. Who here has got a Facebook page? I get more hands with the audience as I normally talk to you, right? That's all going up there. Okay, how did you figure out how to use Facebook? For me, this was seeing what my friends were doing on Facebook and copying the sorts of things they do. Is that a common experience? Yeah. How did you figure out how to use your mobile phone? For many of us, it's a pure gesture thing that we explore, we experiment, and figure out what it does. But it's also a social thing if we see what our friends have done with their phones and we look at what apps they've got installed on their machines. A little bit about Skinner. This is. Can you hear that? Okay. Oh, start from the beginning, guys. Right? Or in fact, anything involving the use of words or symbols. Each student is using a teaching machine. A device that creates vastly improved conditions for effective study. What are teaching machines? How are they used? What can they teach? Who prepares the material they teach? And how does this material differ from textbooks, lectures, and educational television? What impact will machine teaching have on school organization? Some of these questions can be answered in at least a preliminary way. Does that not strike people as ever so slightly similar to these integrated learning systems of set the child in front of the tennis street and beam some maths questions at them, depending on how they do, they can have a go at some other maths questions. Yeah, I'm going to ask you some times tables questions. Oh, well, then we might get some more times tables questions. Purely mechanical device, right in the little window, crank the handle around, it tells you whether you got it right or wrong straight away. I think what's happening with most. Let's rephrase that. At its heart, ICT education isn't about answering questions. Okay, we use the machine sometimes like that. But ICT education at its heart is about coming up with an understanding of how the machine in front of you works. We focus a lot, I know, on skills. But at its heart, the subject is about developing this understanding of how the computer works. You all have these mental models. You all have these schema, as Piaget would have described it, how you think the computer works, how you think the internet works. And most of the time, we learn through assimilation. And we, yeah, we can use that. We can use Excel because we've used Word, or because we've used PowerPoint. The skills transfer across, and there aren't any surprises. But once in a while, don't we have that wonderful <coughs> aha moment when the machine doesn't do what you expect it to? And isn't that when the best learning happens, or is that just me? Is that when you start getting the Yes, he is, absolutely. And you know, the, the stuff which we're hearing so much more about now about coding provides that experience so much. I mean, it won't do what I want it to do. Why won't it do what I want it to do? Because I don't understand properly. But that experience, that cognitive conflict of the machine, the real world, the computer there works differently from how I expect it to, is such an important opportunity for learning. So I would say, you know, let's go back to Piaget and let's say, once in a while, let's put those obstacles in the way of our pupils. Let's have opportunities when it doesn't work as they expect. It should be hard once in a while. You know, why are ICT lessons dull and boring and harmful, as our Secretary of State <coughs> describes them? Because it's easy too much, and it shouldn't be easy. The best experiences I think I've had, and I suspect you've had with computers, are where you've figured something out for yourself and it hasn't worked how you expect. Does anybody want to contradict me at this point? That's good. I like that. <laughs> right, I'll move on in that case. Um, okay, we put this slide up at the beginning of most of our uh, programs at Roehampton. We talk about three ways of learning. I'd like to show a family sphere. Um, and we say, when it comes to learning with ICT, I reckon there are essentially these three ways of going about it. There may be more. You can play with the toys, you can build things, you can experiment, you can have a go for yourself and sort of play those learning. Or you can read the instruction manual and the help files and the YouTube video walkthroughs, or you can talk to somebody about this stuff. And I think there are parallels there with you know, Papert and 
um, Vygotsky certainly, and Piaget as well, I would say. So if you had to pick one of those three, let me just play, or can I have the manual or the worksheet or the instructions, please? Or can you tell me about this, or can you just show me how to do this? When it comes to learning something new on a computer, which one would you pick? Could you put your hand up, please, if you would like to just play with this and explore and experiment for yourself? <coughs> Fine, thank you very much. If you'd like to have the manual there, Okay? If you'd like to have somebody to talk to you about it. Isn't that interesting? That's, that's really interesting. So it's sort of, I don't know, I didn't do, Roger, did you count for me? No, I didn't. Oh, no. So I, I put that as sort of 40, 20, 40, or maybe 35, 20, 45, something of, of that order. We ask the same questions of our students, as I say. Let me just zoom out for a moment. Um, zoom over. I want to zoom in on this one first. So this is what they say when we ask them the same question. 42% like to explore, like to expand. These are undergraduates, so these have just been in. Most of our undergraduates have come through our primary secondary education, then come to Roehampton. Not all of them by any means. 26% um, like to have the manual, like to have the worksheet, which is a shame for them because I don't do worksheets. And the other 32% would like to have that support there, somebody on site. And I suspect if you look in a primary school these days, or a secondary school these days, you'll get more and more in that sort of rather nice lilac part of the wedge of, I like to explore, I like to experiment. Let me show you some of the things that... Will there? Yeah. In my classrooms, I, I would do a bit of all three, <clears throat> and I wouldn't just stick to manuals. I, I actually have a manual, I have a booklet on how to do yes. this. Yes. Um, uh, the basic skills, yeah. and then I get the children then to then play with, after that, play with the, the software. But I'm there as that person to the one to one. I think, I think that's exactly right. Do you want to sit for us to work? You've probably got it already. It's lovely to have you here. We have that. I, I mean, the, the whole learning style of thing, I'm tremendously skeptical about. But then if I see an eight that you've been going to have um, you know, the, the, the correct answer to my question was, Marzi depends. Of course it depends. And, you know, which of us is not going to move on the answer, or have a look at the half hour one to this stuff? Well, perhaps one or two, but most of us will eventually give up, or even phone tech support, but I don't have to take a positive experience. But, you know, that said, when children are learning to do this stuff for themselves, when they're not in school, I suspect there are more and more in that playlist. Let me just figure it out for yourself. Look at how they use their mobile phones. Look at how they use websites. You know, there is no school in the country that are teaching people how to do text messaging. Yet you know, most of our school leavers have kind of picked that up somewhere along the way. And the same is going to be true of many, many of the skills that they have. I wanted to show you some of the quotes from our postgraduates, which puts me back on track now. So we asked them to describe some of their ICT learning experiences. And this is some of the stuff which they said. I didn't really gain much from being sat down and taught how to use ICT technology. Most ICT lessons I remember being taught things that I was personally very comfortable with already. That's not good teaching, is it? Somebody who does like having somebody there, and somebody who's figured out that Google is a really good source of help. Problem when people have a go and they learn, but they've actually learned in a clumsy way that is not correct, not not correct because it is not streamlined, because it ignores certain uh, things that need to be like I, I teach yeah. note taking, yeah. and, and they know how to copy and paste. Um, they already know how to take notes, and they don't want to care about citing their source or yeah. you, you know mind mapping. So it is meeting them where they are and taking them on to somewhere new, and which for us is not going to be exciting about learning something new. Um, I, my first degree was in mathematics, and there was this, this phrase around the time there about the good mathematician is a lazy mathematician. It always looks as the quickest way of doing something. And I think the same applies when it comes to computing, when it comes to IT. But we should be looking for the shorter, more efficient, more effective ways of doing something. And this is where I think the interventions can come in. You know, we all know it from our own experience with technology. When somebody looks over our shoulder at how we're doing things and says, I want to show you a quick way of doing it. Isn't that good teaching? Isn't that good assessment of their learning and then taking them on to someone new? Yeah, but you well, still have to crack in when they think they already know. And they 
okay. Yes, that we becoming aware of our own ignorance is really thing. And I think this comes back to not being challenging. Perhaps. Because my experience is that when I come in with this kind of advice, they resent it. Especially my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to sort of get involved in the domestic here. <laughs> it's a shame. Perhaps there are ways of doing it. I mean, we, if we have time, the way things are going, we'll get on to Prensky and partnering and the, how a teacher intervenes when working with a digital native who doesn't know it all but perhaps thinks that they do. Um, setting challenges. And one other quote from our postgrads. Trial and error. It's what we all do. Well, it's what most of us do, I would suggest. Okay. This slide I've already shown you. This is the one where we ask them, we give them 18 skills and we say, how good are you at these things? And the stuff up at the, at the, down at the bottom of the list, pretty much all of our guys can do, you know, not quite with their hands tied behind their back, but, you know, using email, yeah, we know how to do that. Using Facebook, apparently, 28% of them are expert already when it comes to using Facebook. All of that stuff at the bottom, you would not be surprised by. Interestingly, one student commented, yeah, but Miles, most of that stuff at the bottom of the list we didn't learn in school, we taught ourselves. I think there's a significant observation there. The stuff at the top of the list is cause for concern. Programming is something where I have 65% of my students, new undergraduates, saying we have no experience of that at all. This is something which we cannot do. Despite most of them having come through 14 years of primary and secondary education with programming there on the national curriculum. It's something which perhaps they've not realized they've been taught, or maybe they've simply not been taught. Uh, the control technology, again, underrepresented. For, for us, you know, an issue about using interactive whiteboards. So they've been in secondary school, they've seen interactive whiteboards, but never had the experience of using one with, for themselves. And working with video, still, you know, these people who've just left school. The notion that I have, what is that? Over half of my new students with no or very basic grasp of editing videos, and that's such a shame when this is such an easy thing to do. And, you know, I think there's, there's something should be done about that. We asked them as well this year. Can you just interrupt? Yeah. Okay. Just do you want the slide back? That, that chart is very interesting because I was just kind of a thought that this is for students, right? Yeah, new undergrads. I'd rather you overlay that. The same <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'd be allowed to share with you. So I hope I hope you'll answer on later on what you do differently in preparing your teachers yeah. for this. I've got the examples I've given. It's a couple, it's two and a half years since I was teaching in school myself, and that was as a head teacher, which is not really proper teaching. You know, it's a while since I've been teaching real life children. This sort of thing. So the examples I'm drawing on later um, are about the sort of things which we're doing with our students. Now. So hold on, we'll get that with a bit of luck. Okay, um, we asked them this year as well. Okay, so we've got this measure of their skills when it comes to ICT. We also ask them to self-assess their knowledge of IT and their understanding of IT. And actually, Dunn said all the skills figure is pretty good. We've done this well thus far. They are pretty competent across those 18 things. But their knowledge of IT, and more significantly for me, their understanding of IT, is significantly worse than their skills. Look at the understanding graph here. What's that number? 36% of my new undergraduates ticks the tick box to say, I have no understanding of how technology works. <laughs> what has happened? over these 14 years. I don't think this is a Roehampton thing. I really don't think this is a Roehampton thing. I think this is a you know, we focus too much on how to get things done and not enough on how they work. So yeah, this is something which I'm determined to address, really. If you, oh, yes, hi. This is, oh, I did have the, the, the number on the first slide. I think it's 256 or so. We get about 280 undergraduates. Um, but, um, this is a Prezi says online now. I'm, going, I'm hoping to get a screen recorder recording off this, but if I move away from the microphone, it will drift in and out. <laughs> yes. So with a bit of luck, I'll put this up and 
I'd say I'll send you the link, but my email address is going to be up on the slide at the end. Um, so yeah, we then, we then cross-tab the skills, knowledge, and understanding against those learning styles things. Skills, fine. Knowledge, fine. But look at the understanding graph here. Yeah. Those of them who like to have that one-to-one -one support score significantly lower on understanding than those who like to explore and experiment for themselves. So where's the, where's the interesting line? The interesting line is it competent or above. If they like to explore and play and experiment, we get a third of them competent, proficient, or expert. For those who like to have that one-to-one -one support, somebody telling them what to do or helping them there, it's 15%. What I don't have for you is which way causality works. Is it that those who play an experiment get a better understanding, or is it those who understand are much happier playing and experimenting? Which way do you think it works? So the better your understanding, the further you'll go. Yeah, who agrees with that? Yeah, like a nod, so not just a pat. <laughs> okay. What about the other? I get the impression it's a kind of dialogue between the two. I like that. That's probably, I mean, I, I'd love to do some more research on this and try to actually start talking to my students about you know, which way around is that for you? When did you get to this point of pain? Yeah, how much of that actually helps you to understand? The, the data here is all, of course, self-assessed, self-reported. Um, it's not absolutely rigorous. This is not working. There's an online poll thing. I think we've probably got time. Let's have a go at this very, very quickly now. Um, were you told to turn your mobile phone off when you came in? That's a relief. Okay. <laughs> Could you have a go at this then, please? Um, name three... Can I do this in full screen mode? View. Okay, what you've got to do is text the word move on, and then what I want from you is three qualities you'd like your pupil, students, learners to have when they move on from you to the next phase of their education. This is easier for those of you in sort of particular education settings, I know. Um, so pick three qualities, just one word to describe each of the three qualities, and then do it one of three ways either text move on and then that move <coughs> number or tweet thing, or submit, move on, and then a message to the URL on the screen. See how this goes. First time I tried it with a big audience. It says they will appear here. That's lovely, yes. Like that. Perhaps it only allows one. Oh. That can't just be a coincidence. Handwriting's okay. I, I, I'm kind of into calligraphy. It's a good thing, handwriting. Patience, yes. Another one coming in. I'm going to press the escape key here. And ask, would the person who just tweeted or texted boldness drive inspiration mind doing that hand? Thank you very much. If that's what you want, how do you teach? If you want them to be bold, how do you go about teaching for boldness? Well, I usually don't because my job is to try and get teachers to move on with their computers. Okay. And Main feeling is that once they discover that it actually works, then they will suddenly realize, yeah. aha, yes, yeah. Okay, um, who is the person in pencil of learning autonomy, please? Thank you very much. 
If you want your pupils to be autonomous, how do you teach? Anybody? Give them autonomy. You allow them to make decisions. Yeah. Yes? There's a person on the long hair. Enthusiasm. Who's the, who's the person of confidence and defense enthusiasm? Thank you very much, Jason. So if you want your learners to be enthusiasts, how does that determine your teaching? I'm convinced that these qualities, there's more stuff coming up. Yes, these are such good ideas. I'm convinced that these qualities are things which they will pick up from us as teachers. If we're enthusiastic, if we have the autonomy that she tweeted about, then they will see that in us and, and want to emulate that themselves. That these qualities that we want them to have surely ought to determine the way which we teach these set things. So the point really is think about that. Think about what it is your aims, your aspirations for them are. And that should determine the way you teach. I want to talk a little more now, how do you, about some of the more modern, more digital uh, does anybody recognize the gentleman with the beard on the screen behind? Seymour Packard, absolutely. The man behind Logo, what is this, 40 years ago? Now pretty much from the Logo programming language. And this great, great insight of constructionist learning. That it's heart the digits the learning process. Yes, we learn through exploring and experimenting and playing as Piaget would have. Yes, we learn from talking to others and listening to others as we got to see that. But we also learn best when we build things. And this is, for me, such an important part of ICT education. But there in the ICT lessons, in IT lessons, it ought to be about building things for other people to see. And of course, this is what Papert did with Logo as a way of teaching of children learning mathematics by writing these programs to see what happened with the turtle. This, to return to your question from earlier, is the sort of thing which we're doing with our students. So you, know, you saw on the early graph that they don't know how to use an interactive whiteboard when they join Roehampton. The first lesson which we teach, to use a loose expression there, on interactive whiteboards, we say, OK, this is the software, smart notebook. I want you to produce for me by the end of the session a slide about how you'd use ICT to teach this topic and stop talking then. And they figure it out for themselves. You know, this is half an hour, 40 minutes work from students who've never used this software before. And all of them figured out how to get things done. There is no need for something like this, at least, to teach this. And they've made something. They've made something which they then share with one another. And then, again, with our second, uh, second year, sorry, first year ICT specialist students, we're using Scratch, and they're creating computer games with a sort of literary or children's literature theme to them. And OK, we're doing a little more teaching there. We're showing the setting problems and setting challenges. But they're building something using the toolkit for other people to use. It's a very meaningful, I would suggest, experience of learning. Raphael, Jason, do you want to say anything about the Scratch experience at this point that you weren't expecting? That sort of interaction. I was going to say about Scratch. We just came, from, we just came up from the uh, Microsoft uh, Office 365. Uh, and they were showing us code. And the, the cool thing about code is I didn't realize that you can actually program from your Xbox. So literally, you can now use the Xbox to teach. In fact, I don't need to teach them as a gamer myself. I'm not even trying to teach anything. But they can stay at home, make a game on the, on the Xbox using code, and then bring that into the classroom. You know, my job is done. Code works on top computers too. Yeah. And they said you can run a and it's free software. But it's very much based on the Packard legacy, yeah. you know, via Scratch. It's very simple. Building things, and if it goes wrong, have a go and fix it. It's a really nice example. Coding is such a good example of all of this Papert stuff. Um, and then, you know, the Scratch is out of MIT Media Lab, and they have, you know, it's the group there is called the Lifelong Kindergarten. And this comes back to my Frogel stuff at the beginning about kindergarten style learning and play based learning is such an important part of this, not just for the preschoolers. Throughout education, the cycle that they have there, start by imagining something and then make it better 
and this sort of iterative development process that's at the heart of scratch programming is so much coding, really, or at least the way we can teach coding in school. Moving on to Prensky and this whole digital native digital immigrant thing, who here believes in the whole digital native digital immigrant thing? Two, really. The argument is that children these days think differently because of this early exposure to technology. There is this brain plasticity argument that if you put an iPad in front of a one-year-old, that will change the way their minds work and they look at the world differently because of this use of technology right from birth onwards. And so Prensky, and, and largely the, the thing which one's supposed to say now, ah yes, but digital natives has been discredited. Nevertheless, I think there are some interesting arguments here. Is there anybody who's really ideologically opposed to digital natives, digital immigrants? Okay, that's fine. Right, we'll talk a little more. Okay, so Premsky's latest book is about how you go about teaching. You know, considering us as the digital immigrants, um, how do you go about teaching these, these digital natives? And he says you partner with them. And these are the sorts of things which they want, which, which those who've grown up around technology expect or learn best through. Some of which I feel very comfortable with, some of which bothers me ever so slightly. And says, okay, if these are the sort of people you're working with, how does that determine what happens in your classroom? He says, well, you let the students do the things which they're good at. And he gives us six bullet points for that. But you have teachers doing the sorts of things that they're good at too. So those of you who raise issues about what if they don't want to learn how to do it properly, Prensky's solution is that our role of working with digital natives is about creating, asking the right questions, guiding the student, you know, stock phrases about guide on side rather than sage on stage, says he's standing from the stage, um, putting the material in a context that's relevant, sitting alongside, working one-to-one, -one. and yeah, that expectation of rigor, that, you know, your first attempt isn't necessarily the best, and that Quality does matter. Sending it back and saying, have another go. The person who put handwriting in their response to the early survey, yes. No, take pride in the quality of your work. Okay. And this sort of partnering thing, you can do collaboratively using technology. This is an example from Wikipedia. This, interestingly, is the simple version of Wikipedia rather than the proper one, which is much more useful for work in school. It's written for people or created for people who are learning English. So use simple Wikipedia because most of the children you're working with are probably still learning English. Um, and then this sort of KWL. Anybody using KWL with their learners? Do you want to explain what it is? Yeah, so, you know, absolutely. I mean, it's, 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 I suppose you can think about it in terms of assessment and learning, but they know what they know already. They know what they'd like to find out, and then you can work alongside them to let them learn that stuff for themselves. And occasionally, I suppose, teach them those things. You meet them where they are and let them set at least some of that agenda. I want to move on to the game based learning now. The advocates of game-based learning say lots and lots of really, really good things about playing computer games, that when you're playing a computer game, you're very much goal-orientated. There is this level of interactivity. You do something on the computer or the Xbox, and it reacts in a certain sort of way. You know how well you're doing. You've got your little health meter or your experience point score or whatever. You've got that instant feedback. You have that strong sense of progression of level two being harder than level one. It is hard. And, you know, who here plays computer games? Not enough of you, I would suggest. Don't play some computer games. Okay. But it is a difficult thing to do. The games companies have figured out that making it hard, making it challenging, is the way to keep people coming back. And then once in a while you move into the Chichemni High Sense state of flow, of being so absorbed in the game that you're playing that time seems to pass by, which I know is an experience many of us find with marketing books. Wouldn't it be nice if these six things were part of what happened in our classrooms too. That we had this sort of thing happening in our ICT lessons. So the argument goes, let's make learning IT more like playing computer games. And you know, perhaps coding is the new gaming. 
James Bourgui talks about it eloquently in terms of as a way of learning about literacy. Or, or, or the, the way we play video games teaches us more about learning. We can apply those ideas elsewhere. I don't think we've got time to see the video. What do you reckon? Roger, do you want me to keep I've only got four minutes. Raphael's video is well, well worth seeing, so I've run out of time. He talks about, amongst other things, Jane McGonagall's book of taking these game ideas and applying them to other contexts, that the problem with reality is it's not enough like computer games. And you're seeing this with you know, really interesting things like Code Academy. There's this, this whole thing at the moment about, you know, my page for 2012 is to learn how to code. And this is grown-ups as well as students. So Code Academy, you can do all of this on the website, no need to install any software. But look, if you do well, you get badges and you move up to the next level. And you can see what your friends are doing and you're getting that feedback there. So you see the sort of taking the game ideas and applying them to more serious topics. Um, connectivism, Downs and Siemens there, talking about learning at its heart these days. So learning here from digital age. Learning at its heart is about making connections. And those connections can be between the neurons, that learning doesn't really take place unless your brain changes. And we understand more and more about brain science and cognitive science. But learning is also about connecting ideas together. And that's a lot of what we do in schools, I think. And learning is also about connecting people together. And, you know, part of the fun of that is talking to the other people. And, you know, you come to bed a number of times and you meet up with folk and share ideas. Um, the, the screenshot here is of a teach me. Has anybody been to a teach me before? <laughs> Again, not enough of you folks. If it wasn't for the tickets being sold out already, I'd say, come along on Friday evening. We're going to have one up here in the Apex room. The room's going to be full of teachers standing up and doing sort of seven-minute micro-presentations about what they've done in their classroom. <laughs> yeah, just Google Teach Me. You can see where the ones near to you are. Go along to one. It's a great way of doing professional development because, you know, seven minutes of presentation, anybody can sit through that. It's not like listening to Miles for 45 minutes. Um, and this is part of developing this learning network of connecting to other learners. Um, I am going to kind of run out of time, but I wanted to finish, kind of finish, by talking a little about workplace learning in terms of not just teacher education, but us as professionals, that this notion of, of the community as a community of practice, that yes, it is about what we do and our experience, but it's also that sort of sense of identity and being part of a community. And this is you know, one of the ways we're doing this with our Roehampton students is our online blogging here where they're sharing their reflections, the work which they produce in our lectures with one another, for one another to comment on, to critique there. And this happens in the workplace too. You know, this is from apprenticeship patterns. So if somebody's becoming a software, a craft software developer, that's a process of apprenticeship through which they go. You know, a couple of people, Oshinar, I can't remember the author's name, which is a shame, have sort of looked at this as a pattern language and said, these are the processes you go through. And again, this is sort of what we're thinking about in terms of part of ICT education at Roehampton, but I think it applies in education more generally than that. I said I would end with seven bullet points. I have. Does anybody want to comment on those or ask more general questions? Roger said we're out of time. I just allow people to say anything if they want to. Okay. I'll hang around afterwards. But if you want to get in touch, please do. There's an email address up on the screen there. Um, the thing at the bottom is Roehampton's Teach Me. If you're local, come along on 31st of January. We're going to do a Teach Me with our students and you know, some of our staff at Roehampton University. <coughs> yeah.